Here's my round three game of the day from the chess.com Isle of Man International Tournament, where there are 165 players in the open, uh, representing uh, 37 nations, and they're playing for a first prize of £50,000, not to be sneezed at. So here's my game from round three, and it's between Jeffrey Xiong from the United States. He's 17 years old, former world junior champion. He's going to be 18 in a few days. And his opponent is Vishnu Prasanna from India, who's a grandmaster. Rated a fair bit below, 25.04 to Xiong's 26.56, but upsets happen. Let's have a look at the game. So Xiong with the white pieces, and it's a pretty regular opening. A Sicilian and the so-called uh, Taimanov variation. And here, of course, there are many moves, bishop b2, bishop b3, even f4, but knight c6, knight takes knight on c6, has become really the main line of, of this opening. Uh, I think because it leads to, to quite easy piece play for white, you know, you can see white can develop very easily. The downside of this is that it allows black to strike out in the center and to establish this nice strong point on d5, supported by two healthy pawns there. So in terms of structure, there are obviously similarities with the French. So white castles. And here the normal move is for black to play the king's knight out to f6. But Prasanna uh, played queen c7 here. Um, and, and off to rook e1, of course, an absolutely normal move, bringing the rook into the middle of the board. Bishop b7, so he's developing on, on the queen side first. Now, this is obviously risky when you don't develop your kingside pieces and that leaves the king in the middle. Has been played before, but not too often. Um, Michael Adams played b3 here, looks pretty normal, but e5 played by Xiong, and that pawn, of course, as in the French, controls those two squares d6 and f6, making it just a little bit more difficult for black to develop pieces normally um, and potentially providing a spearhead for an attack for white on the king's side. So c5 and that of course is the downside of releasing the, t the tension and pushing forward is that black can now has now established these, this nice pawn duo in the middle. So there are, there are pros and cons to this. Queen g4 has been played before here and but instead um this young plate b3 now black plays the, the standard french move knight e7 um, g6 and bishop g7 is possible which at least shuts out white's bishop and now knight a4 absolutely standard move in these positions the knight can't really be hit here and it looks at that c5 pawn and also perhaps prepares to advance the c pawn at some moment. If knight g6, which normally would be the standard move in this kind of position, um, which sort of blunts the power of the bishop on d3, then queen h5 allows the queen to settle on a really active square. So black went the other way, uh, knight c6. I guess the downside of this is that it takes a piece away from the king's side, so makes it easier for white to attack there. Bishop f4 supports the e-pawn. And now the move we'd like to play is bishop e7, and potentially castles king's side. But, well, queen g4 presents a few problems straight away actually. Um, castles would obviously allow bishop h6 and g6, um, well you know there are dark square weaknesses there but I mean this this it's possible to play like this with with black. Instead black plays 
to my eyes, a very risky move, h5. Of course, it's nice to gain space. If the queens were off the board, then this kind of pawn advance is, is very sound, or, or could be sound. But here, now we have to ask ourselves, well, what is Black's king doing? It's unlikely to go to the king side. So queen side, hmm, staying in the middle, who knows? It just, in practical terms, makes life a little bit difficult for Black. But I guess he wanted to stop the queen coming to either g4 or h5. But I think the cure might be worse than the actual disease. c3, well, why has he done that? We're going to see that in a second. Um, after queen e2, basically, if queen e2 had happened straight away, then that knight could have come to b4 to exchange off this very important attacking piece. So that's why c3 was played. And now king f8, and I think that really is indicative of the problems that black has in this position, because obviously he can't castle kingside, um, but feels the need to sort of shuffle over with the king. I think he wants to play g6 and king g7 and leave the rook on h8 to support the h-pawn, but it's slow. Rook at ac1. Well, we'll see the point to that in a second, but just in general, very often it's nice to place the rook opposite your opponent's queen, and there are tactical advantages to that, as we're about to see. h4. Well, that gets blocked with h3, and that, of course, is a useful move for white anyway. It takes away the uncertainty in the position with you know, potentially allowing that h-pawn to advance, and also gives the king uh, a bolt hole on h2. g6, so black continues with his plan of wanting to play the king to g7 to, to finally connect the rooks. I mean, the other advantage of playing g6, the other possibility is that the rook can come to h5 to attack the e-pawn. So, well, there is, there is method in black's uh, plan here. Queen e3, excellent move, looking at the c pawn and also potentially looking at g5 and h6. The queen, uh, very happy to run along those dark squares. And here, if d4, then after the exchange, now we can see a, a direct use of the rook on c1. Then we can play queen takes d4 and exploit the pin on the c file so if we just go back um, black therefore played knight b8 to cover the pawn on c5 well that's uh, very much a compromise i'm sure um uh, vishnu didn't want to retreat the knight it doesn't look very pretty and and after this well jeffrey Zhong taking the initiative with bishop g5, exchanging off those dark squared bishops will allow the queen to run round on those dark squares. Bishops exchanged and knight d7, which covers these important points. Now already white can consider sacrificing on g6 with bishop takes g6. It doesn't seem to work um it's very very tempting with with black's queen across the other side of the board but rook e8 seems to hold um but always worth bearing in mind b4 played instead and i, and I think this is really excellent strategy because basically white is playing on both sides of the board and when black's king is on f8 splitting the rooks this is classic play whereas for, for white, it's very easy. He's very well coordinated. Those rooks can switch, for example, to the queen side very easily with and, and supporting each other. So b4, an excellent move. Here, I can understand why Vishnu didn't want to play c4 because that would um, somehow give white a positional advantage. Uh, you know, potentially very nice overlap on the queen side 
and this knight at some point could hop into c5 and, and maybe the d4 square could be used as well, perhaps a rook swinging up the board. Um, but compared to what happened in the game, well, let's see what happened. Rook h5. Queen came back. Now there is a threat to take on g6. So if king g8, then we can see how playing on both sides of the board is potentially really advantageous for white. So the queen comes into f6, threatening all kinds of sacrifices, you know, with bishop g6 and queen g6 and queen e6. But also, crucially, when black defends against that, then white has the option to support the queen by attacking on the queen side, hitting that loose bishop, and that could be very, very useful indeed. So let's go back. So Vishnu took on e5. So now things are getting extremely complicated. Obviously, if black can survive this, then he has a, a, a wonderful pawn structure. But it's not so clear because the queen comes in and starts hassling the king. Now, black has this choice. Do you go to the king side with king g8 or come into the middle? I can understand why he went into the middle here, because it's behind the big clump of pawns. And if king g8, then bishop g6 is already very tempting. Or if white wants to play, um, doesn't want to risk so much, you can take here and simply take here on c5. And once again, white is playing on both sides of the board. Potential to sacrifice on the king side or take this pawn off. And the rook is able to attack down the b-file as well. But king g8 possible, but very risky. But instead, king e7 played. Xiong took on c5. And now, obviously, there's pressure through the middle. Queen h4 check is happening as well. g5 protects the h-pawn. But that queen, really active on g7, now attacks e5, also attacking the pawn on g5. Rook's exchanged. And this is looking serious. Queen g5 um, looks nasty. Bishop g6 in the air as well. So therefore, queen f4 protects f7, protects g5, and also, to some extent, pins white's rook to the back rank. Um, you know, there could be possibilities to give a perpetual, although the bishop does stand very well on d3 and can actually block on f1. But here, white switches to the b-file. Excellent. So queen on this side of the board, and the black king in the middle, shot by both sides. Uh, the rook coming down the b-file, looking very nasty indeed. Bishop c6, and now rook b6. Pressure on the bishop. And here, if queen c1, then white's king is still snug. Um, sorry, coming back to this position. Rook b6. Now it's tough. I suppose the, the normal move here is rook c8, but well, we'll just whip that pawn off, um, keeping the pressure. The king came over, king d7. Rook b4. Now this is an excellent move, because that queen was really holding black's position together. But once the queen is displaced, well, we'll see what happens. King comes to h2. Now obviously no check on f4 because of the rook on the fourth rank so the king is quite safe queen f7 threatened so the king moves across and now queen e5 well as i like to say every picture tells a story a couple of moves ago the queen on f4 was holding things together but now the queen white queen has centralized taking the place of black queen looking in all directions and this is completely dominating with the black queen sidelined 
if for example rook d8 to prevent queen d6 check then the rook comes in a rook b7 black is not going to survive long there with the threat of c6 in the game we had bishop b5 but i'm afraid this did not help black at all a4 is an excellent move if bishop takes bishop it's mate in two laser beams and the bishop comes back this is the game continuation and here black resigned there's simply no defense to all the threats queen d6 check or pawn advance to c6 winning a piece so well for me a very nice strategic game by jeffrey zyong and well as i mentioned at the start rating of 2656 he is a very promising player um i can imagine that he will be um knocking on the door of the the u.s team very soon uh, there's competition for all those players even though they're a fantastically strong team uh, as i said he's he's about to turn 18 so he's improving all the time and with this victory he is one of only six players after three rounds with three out of three and his reward is to play Maxime Vachelagrav in the fourth round and that is going to be a real test for him so we'll see how he gets on. Thanks very much for watching do click the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber already and do consider joining us in the inner circle on patreon.com powerplay chess and do check out the rewards you get for making a small monthly contribution supporting the channel. Thanks very much for watching.